All right, I'd like to call to order the July 8th, 2024 Mount Lake Terrace Planning Commission meeting to order. Would you please take the roll? Chair Batista? Here. Vice Chair Harrison? Oh, present. I'm not sure if I was called. Sorry. It, <laughs> my lost connection there and it just joined me back again. Um, but yes, I'm present. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Stenson? Present. Commissioner Thompson? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Betcher? Present. Commissioner Landis? Here. All right, uh, moving on to item number three, approval of the June 10th, 2024 meeting minutes. Does anybody have any changes or corrections? I am not hearing or seeing any, so we'll go ahead and declare those accepted as presented. Uh, item, item number four, uh, public comment. Um, let the record show we have no public here tonight in person. Did we have anybody who signed up in advance to make a public comment online? No one has signed up online. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to item number five, comprehensive plan update, uh, full draft plan review. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, Chair Batista, Vice Chair Harrison, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, Jonathan Morales, Senior Planner at City of Malik Terrace, and I'm here today with Sierra Carson from OTAC. So today um, we are formally starting our draft review, um, draft plan review process for the comprehensive plan. Um, this follows the final um, series of um, briefings with Planning Commission on June 10th. Um, so today we're kicking off the draft plan review process with a um, re review of the introduction chapter and the next steps on the um, process going forward for the draft plan. Um, so quick agenda, reviewing the schedule where we are right now um, and subsequent meetings and engagement opportunities. Second item is review the outline of the draft plan and then discuss the draft plan introduction, which you have in front of you, I believe. Um, we'll wanna go through some reflections that we heard from CPAG and also ask them um, if perhaps um, Commissioner Betcher would like to share any reflections as well. And then review next steps going forward. So in terms of schedule, uh, we are early July, uh, July 8th, uh, formally kickstarting the review process um, we've concluded review of each element, goal, and policies with Planning Commission. Um, the goal and policies were formally um, recommended by the CPAC group uh, at their June 26 meeting. So everything that you are that you have in front of you in terms of the condensed matrix of element, goals, and policies are those that were recommended by the CPAC group. Um, so that's their former recommendation. Uh, we do have an upcoming August engagement opportunity for the draft EIS. Um, it will be right before the August 12th Planning Commission meeting. Um, I believe we're going to start around 4.30 to 6.30, so about a two-hour event um, with opportunities for um, questions. We'll have a presentation, and we're still formulating what that meeting is going to look like, but August 12th is the date, so 4.30 to about 6.30, uh, right before the Planning Commission meeting. Um, and so we are going to be with Planning Commission until the first, sorry, second week of September. So September 9th, um, we're targeting the public hearing um, recommendation by Planning Commission to City Council. Um, and target adoption by Council, we're targeting mid-October 2024. Any questions on schedule? Um, so the purpose of today is to go over the introduction chapter. The introduction chapter is broken down by 
four um, sections. So we have a community vision section. We have a community profile section, which is sort of like a history of the city um, and demographics, things like that. Um, purpose and scope of a comprehensive plan. So informing the reader, what is the purpose of a comprehensive plan? Why do we need a comprehensive plan? Um, and then sort of the scope of, of each element. And then the planning process and public participation, um, which is required for comprehensive plan updates. Um, second section of the comprehensive plan, which we'll be reviewing in subsequent meetings, are the actual plan element chapters. So we will be bringing this to you in two parts. Um, there's gonna be a part one reviewing, um, I believe, not sure it's gonna be structured just yet, but um, there'll be two parts um, bringing forward the element chapters. And then we have appendices, so that's gonna be your public engagement um, summaries or sub-area plans, things like that. Um, and then I think with that, I don't know if you wanna add anything to the plan outline. Well, Jonathan, I think you just about covered it. Um, I guess just to add a bit, the appendices will also include information such as the background report on all the housing information, um, as well as the transportation analysis, those big, heavy technical documents that are really important for the comprehensive plan, but don't necessarily need to make up the bulk of the plan document. They really are supporting documentation. Um, really the goal um, of, one, one of the goals in this revision process is to make this just a, a user-friendly document that someone might actually want to open up and use and not a really text-heavy, lengthy uh, document of just black and white text on a page. Um, what you'll find in the, I think it's the, in the online packet of information is we've included an example of what the plan template will actually look like. Um, so you have in front of you uh, for the introduction today is um, obviously in Word, um, but by looking at the plant template, you can start to get a feel of what that will actually look like um, once that gets, uh, once everything gets finalized um, within the uh, design programs. Um, and then also on the different element structure, the different element information, um, we've really been focused so far on the goals and policies because that really is the bulk of what makes up the plan as well as subsequent implementation items. Um, but we'll also be looking at um, some of those purpose statements and then a bit of supporting narrative that does go along with the goals and policies. And that'll again be reviewed um, at those August meetings. Um, but we just really, again this morning, or this afternoon, this evening, focus on the introduction text. All right, so we have um, a couple of slides here just to walk through sort of the purpose of each of those four sections uh, that Jonathan uh, sort of went through before. Um, the goal of tonight is for us to sort of have a conversation about why these are in the plan introduction, um, but we will leave you with this document for about the next week for you to read it in more detail and provide written comments. Um, we have some key guiding questions for you as well to help that review process so you kind of have an idea of what you're looking for as you look at this document. Um, but we're just going to kind of run through um, sort of what what the introduction is currently looking like, um, knowing that this is a draft document that's still in progress is for, you know, we're still in the midst of doing this. So things like public engagement are still draft. Um, all right, but as we move forward, so the first highlight of our plan document is that vision statement. Um, this is something that um, we've gone through public engagement with as well as review with planning commission. Um, so this is our uh, very solid vision statement as it now stands with all that excellent feedback. Um, but in addition to that vision statement, we wanted to sort of visualize what that inclusive and connected and, and uh, you know, city looked like with its neighborhoods and thriving activity centers. So as we go on to the next slide, um, we've started moving into this direction of actually visualizing what that looks like within the plan. Um, so, you know, setting up this, this uh, comprehensive plan for the city for the next 20 years, uh, moving beyond just looking at land use and sub areas, but looking at what does it mean to have, um, you know, a good network of uh, town center mixed use and neighborhood centers. Um, so that's where this draft visual comes in. And really what we're looking for from um, planning commission is just 
you know, looking back to the vision statement, um, you know, what other, this, this is one key value that's really come through um, again and again, um, but we love your comments and feedback on this and also, from, and also hearing from you um, if there's any values from that vision statement that could be um, further described in the plan. I, we have a comment. Um, I'm going to get through these slides, and okay. then I think we can do comments, okay? All right, cool, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so the next section within the comprehensive plan is that community profile. And we wanted to keep this, um, again, sort of at the front of that document, because it's important to, as we start looking at, you know, what does the next 20 years look like? Uh, it's, you know, who are we now and who have we been? Um, so there is a description in here describing the existing context. You know, where are we? Um, that's very important for thinking about who we want to become. Um, and also looking at the historical context, especially when it comes to um, who has lived here, who first started living here, um, who lived here before that. Um, and, uh, and then we move into kind of who lives here now. Um, so there is demographic data on population, race, ethnicity, language, age, income, housing costs, education, jobs, and commuting. This is a very high level touch on a lot of these topics. You'll see a much deeper dive into some of this uh, uh, analytical information when it comes to the um, housing background report, um, as there's a, gonna be a lot of really heavy data in there on um, income as well as housing cost, housing cost burden, um, but here we have, and also, as well as education, so here we kind of have a, just a light touch across the board looking at um, who, uh, who the demographics are today and how it's changed over the last couple of years, you know, over the last 10 years, over the last five years, um, to become a sort of who lives in the city um, in, this, uh, in this time period. So as you move from the community profile, um, a really important piece of the introduction is to set the stage on the purpose and the scope. Um, we want to answer the question, why does Mount Lake Terrace need a comprehensive plan? And it's both in part to meet that legal framework, but it's also important um, because it helps the city sort of identify what its goals are for itself and how it wants to grow sort of outside of these legal framework. Um, so we do have a description in here of what the Growth Management Act is, as well as what PSRC's Vision 2050 goals are, as well as the Snohomish County CPPs to provide that context. Um, but again, um, we want to start with that question of sort of why, why do we need this, why do we want this, and then this is how we're going to do it. Um, we also have some overarching information here about growth targets. Um, and that, again, will be repeated in um, some of the other elements as well, specific to population targets, housing targets, and um, employment targets. Um, but that overall information about, you know, this is how many, how many people live here now, how many people we expect to live here in 2044, um, and further information about capacity will be added to this section um, once this, the process is um, further down the line. Um, so just understanding this is um, sort of uh, half-baked at the moment because we are um, still finalizing um, the draft EIS process. Um, and then the last uh, section in the purpose and scope is information about implementation. Um, you'll notice as you walk through, um, not the introduction text, but again, that a large document of goals and policies is we've identified um, a vast selection of different strategies or actions or plans that could be taken um, as part of implementation of the plan, um, as well as references to different functional plans and development regulations, which will all help um, with the implementation uh, of the comprehensive plan. Um, and then some of the key questions that we have on the purpose and scope is just knowing that because this is such a sort of a technical section um, is, you know, is this readable and understandable to the general public? And are there places where we could make it more uh, user-friendly and easier to understand uh, for the general public? And then our last section here within the introduction is our uh, a description of the planning process and engagement. Um, it's very important for the plan to describe why engagement is important. Um, and we also want to show 
uh, sort of what the planning process uh, has looked like um, and how various different uh, people from the community have been included in the process. Um, so instead of a very sort of long-winded description of engagement, um, as we will have a written summary as an appendix to this plan, um, we'll be pre uh, preparing um, a visual timeline that kind of shows all the different groups that have been incorporated as part of the engagement process, sort of when people have been included in the process, um, and how sort of that um, the communication between the advisory group of the Planning Commission and Council have of sort of brought us to the final adoption page uh, stage along with sort of those key milestones of meeting with the community and some of that focused engagement that's been done as well to uh, include other groups um, who may not uh, generally get in uh, be involved with the comprehensive plan process so I think that is my run through of those four sections um, the next slide here just gives um, again a high level um, uh, sort of summary of some of those key questions we have to help guide your review. Um, but at this point, I would love to open it up to uh, questions or comments. Thanks, I see some looks across the table at me. Um, thanks for outlining this. Um, and um, if I understand it correctly, you're giving this to us tonight to introduce it. We'll give you written comments and then you'll review them at the next meeting. This is a really good approach. I applaud you for doing it. I feel like if we did this with a lot of more things, then I think our working process would be improved. So thank you for doing that. Um, I had uh, two, I think one actually question. Um, so this uh, image you've got at the front here, which shows the mixed use center, the existing neighborhood center, and the proposed neighborhood centers, where are those defined? Where are we defining those in this document? So that is a great question. Um, I think that those can be defined here in the introduction and then referred back through throughout the plan. Um, town center is is defined. We know what town center is, but really the, the definitions for those uh, neighborhood and mixed use centers are still in development because this, the scale of what we're looking for in those places is still under review as part of the draft EIS. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, when I see this image, it like pretty much to me summarizes walkability and sets up like an architecture for how the city is laid out. Um, so I get excited about it, but I think um, if we want comments on like this as part of our review process or if you want comments on this as further down the line, um, I started that off as a statement, but I meant to ask it as a question. Uh, should we comment on that here or should we comment on that elsewhere? Comment on what specifically? Oh, um, mixed use center, existing neighborhood center, like this uh, sort of hierarchy of like neighborhood centers you've set up. Are you, are you intending to comment on the definitions of what they could be or are you looking for um, what to comment on what they will be in the future? I guess I'm not understanding the question, I'm sorry. I think, I think that would be my comment actually like uh, I would, I would probably make some comments on this um, as part of my review for the next meeting, but is that, are you looking for that here or are you looking for that further down the line? Yeah, I think we're looking for that here. Okay. Um, because this is, as we've gone through and revised the goals and policies for the plan, this is um, something that's come up again and again and again. You'll see it come up in the land use element. You'll see it come up in the housing element, in the economic vitality element, in the transportation element. It just, it, it keeps coming up. And so having that common nomenclature that can be referred to throughout was very important. And that's why it kind of ended up here in the introduction as part of the overall vision for the city is it's something that um, is sort of part of all of those different policies um, as far as how growth and, and other priorities are being done. Okay, fantastic. I feel like this and all the challenges sort of inherited in it, it could be almost its own section. Um, but yeah, that's comments for the, the review. And then I also just wanted to make a, convey a comment from CPAG that I heard. Um, they did have a lot of commentary on sort of the the specificity and the citations and things of the demographic data that were cited. Um, just kind of leafing through here, it looks like we've got footnotes and things like that, but um, yeah, just wanted to say that that was a CPAG comment. 
Yes, all data has been verified with dates as well as um, census table citations. Anybody else? Just one kind of following up on Commissioner Betcher's um, comment. Um, as part of our, you know, sub area planning process, I think that's when we're going to be going, obviously diving in a lot more detail on, on these um, neighborhood centers and, you know, mixed use centers. So we'll, I know we're working on some sub areas kind of parallel with this comp plan process, but others, you know, are sort of being deferred, you know, a little bit down the line. So will the sub areas that we really aren't touching this year, is it just going to be more of a placeholder in the comp plan just saying, you know, future goals are to examine blah, 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 or will even those sub areas kind of have a more fleshed out detail to expand, you know, on, you know, what this map shows here? Um, I don't believe there's a plan to have more fleshed out information about the other sub areas beyond the, the Cascade View and the um, uh, Melody Hill uh, sub areas. Um, I think as part of our discussions on the sub areas, um, you know, trying to separate out the vision for these different sort of centers or nodes from the administrative boundaries that are those sub areas or neighborhood boundaries. Um, and there is policy within the, um, within the land use element to uh, review and um, uh, you know, make plans for um, the the centers and, and areas of the city um, on a regular basis. So there's policy support in the plan to continue doing work and um, the work that already has been done will be included as, you know, those appendices to the plan. So for the ones that we, where we have the, we will have the plans in place, you know, kind of when this, the, the comp plan is adopted, the comp can, plan can directly point to C sub area plan X, Y, Z, but for the ones where we don't have one, it's just more of, will there just be like a play? I'm, I'm thinking for somebody who's reading this for the first time, you know, who isn't familiar with our process, yeah. will there just be sort of like a footnote or say, you know, uh, or like a schedule saying, you know, within the next year or two, you know, the Planning Commission City Council plan on addressing this sub area. And then once we do that, the, the document just gets updated instead of saying, we're gonna address it, saying we have addressed it, please see appendices or whatever. Yes, so I will I will maybe direct your review to policy land use 2.5. Um, the policy is currently written says to implement an as needed update sub area plans and planned actions for town center identified mixed use and neighborhood centers with a potential action item to update and implement these neighborhood plans. Um, so that may be some place where we just flesh out in more detail what that implementation plan looks like. Um, if there is a desire to have a set schedule um, or any information like that, um, uh, something that that we could further sort of flesh out um, within the plan document. I would say yes, there is a desire to have a <laughs> fleshed out schedule <laughs> sooner rather than later. But yeah, I, I know we're we've you know we've got a lot on our plate. So um. absolutely, Chair Batista, I would just recommend we maybe not put dates, but I think we can no, yeah, definitely include narratives. And um, I think this goes back to having that conversation now as part of this to say, I know it came up during when we were doing Cascade View and Melody Hill, that if there's a desire to maybe take a look at the names or the areas around uh, what we currently have as sub areas, that that may be something that's also in narrative form that when we get to that next point um, that we talk about, hey, we're going to re-review these, uh, these sub areas. Um, and maybe we do these sub areas around these mixed use and neighborhood centers. To me, that makes sense that if, we, if we're starting to divide the city around these then that's really, to me, where it makes sense where we're building it around these centers. So we could put some narrative in conversation on that. 
we'll have a next major update in 10 years, but that we can, we can amend the plan every year, once a year, right? And for sub areas, we can actually amend the plan whenever, if we have a sub area plan that we need to insert. So I think let's put some um, narrative in there around sub areas. I would think in our land use element where we talk about that more specifically. So that intent is very clear that what we want to do after we adopt the comp plan and the implementation for the new zoning that we then begin to work on those sub areas. And if you guys are comfortable, you know, you can focus on particular sub areas. We kind of talked about that previously. Maybe we want to, you know, these are priority areas that we want to take a look at first or something like that. That that's a, the desire that maybe you want to focus on those. But yeah, I think we could put some more narrative in there. Great. Anybody else? Let me just double check with our online commissioners. We're not forgetting about you. Nothing here. Okay. All right. Um, so I just wanted to to quickly go over these one more time. Um, just you know, to, to round us out on this conversation about the introduction. Um, this is not to say that if you have other thoughts or questions that you cannot add those additional comments. We just wanted to point you in the direction of some of the questions that we had um, that you can help um, in terms of guiding the direction of the, of the introduction here. So again, looking at that, that vision statement, um, and sort of the surrounding narrative that it's currently drafted. Um, are there other key values um, that could be described further in the introduction section? Um, looking at the community profile, um, reading through the story that has been written, um, does the story accurately, um, you know, to, to you reflect um, the community and, and you know from your um, you know experience being here and being part of the community um, are there other important pieces from the past to present that could be um, included here um, as we tell the story of sort of who Mount Lake Terrace is um, and then also looking through the demographics um, if there's questions on existing demographics then um, we'd love to hear those as well um, all sources have been verified um, so everything should be, um, be looking pretty good there um, but again we want to make sure that there's questions we can answer them um, and then as we look through that scope and uh, process section, um, just um, some of the technical, technical information, um, if you have comments or questions on um, how to ex uh, better explain this to the average resident. So um, with that, um, if there's no further um, discussion on the introduction today, um, you will have, again, the next full week to review that in more detail. Um, I think we can move on to um, our section on um, uh, reflecting on our CPAG experience. Just quickly to add to you, we want to make sure that the community introduction chapter is readable um, to the average reader, so also looking for that lens, um, reviewing it through that lens, um, so make sure there's not technical jargon um, in addition to these guiding questions, and whatever other comments and feedback you have. All right. So we uh, had our final uh, CPAG meeting on June 26th, um, where CPAG did give um, their final comments and recommendation for the full list of goals and policies that you see in front of you. Um, and after we went through our um, recommendation vote, um, we asked them another question. Um, we asked them um, to give a reflection on if there was one thing or one or two things that they could think of that they really wanted Planning Commission and City Council to know that that CPAC wanted to see implemented as part of this plan, sort of what came to mind. And so we have um, a couple of the, the high level um, things that were heard that evening um, to share with you all tonight. Um, so I think first and foremost from several different CPAC members, um, the number one thing that was said um, is really focusing on that proactive engagement and education and communication with the community 
is that they see some of the excellent work that the city has done and feel like there's just maybe a disconnect. The people don't really under don't really understand city process and don't really know what's happening. Um, so really, that focus on um, engaging and communicating with the, with the the residents in the community here um, as part of the implementation of this plan. Um, and I think you'll find that there are quite a few policies within the document that do uh, that make communication education a goal. Um, and it's also something um, that I think has been prioritized as part of the council goals as well. Um, but this really was something that came up um, quite a few times um, when we asked CPAC what was the most important thing to them. Um, another aspect was, um, you know, prioritizing and focus on um, climate goals and impacts. Um, it's not been, um, you know, a the largest focus um, on, in previous iterations, um, but really there was, um, you know, a lot of conversations about um, natural gas and sustainability and climate and other factors. Um, and so that was, again, something um, that they wanted to make sure that Planning Commission and Council knew was important to them. Um, you know, third, uh, making the city more friendly to those visiting, um, to be accessible and welcoming, and being accessible to, you know, those who may not be reading English signs. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about wayfinding, but, you know, wayfinding additionally for those um, who may not have English as their first language, um, as well as accessibility. Um, you know, we talk a lot about walkability and connectivity, um, and so thinking about um, how we can make sure that those pathways are accessible for those who, you know, have, may have limited sight um, or may um, sort of not understand, um, you know, how to get around. So um, that was, again, something that was brought up uh, by CPAG. Uh, number four, um, making the most out of the light rail investment. I'm understanding that's a really important big piece of infrastructure that's come to the city in the last couple of years and, um, you know, making sure that, um, and it was a comment to, for planning commission and city council to know that, um, you know, to make the most out of that investment um, in the city. And then number five, to prioritize city uh, aesthetics and code enforcement. Um, so just knowing that, um, you know, thinking about um, beautification, um, taking care of our assets, um, especially when it comes to, um, you know, planters um, and other, um, you know, things that, and, and maintenance of our existing uh, facilities um, and our civic spaces is, is maintaining them um, and working with the community as well. Um, so I think on this, um, I would love to um, maybe if our CPAG um, ambassador, sorry, I forgot the official word here. Liaison. Liaison, <laughs> I might want to share a few words um, on your reflections here with CPAG. Yeah, so um, thank you. And also, um, thank you all for being very engaged in the process as well. I've seen you, a lot of you at these meetings, and I know a lot of you, you know, listen in as well. So I think um, it speaks to the importance of the weight that we place on the words of uh, CPAG and how they've influenced this in gathering community engagement. So I really appreciate that because uh, it makes my job easier. Um, <clears throat> I uh, think that was a good summary. Um, Shannon was really kind and sent me a bunch of notes she took because at the very end of the process, they asked for final words to be shared and everyone had, you know, a lot of great comments and, you know, to narrow it down to five bullet points, I think is a bit of a task. Um, but I do think the, the biggest takeaway I got was um, the city um, in terms of that first one there, education, engagement, and communication with the community. There's a lot wrapped up in that statement. Um, it's not just about informing people and doing outreach during the count plan process. It's about building connections with, um, and taking leadership in building connections with people in the business community and people with the housing development community, um, actually funding some of these things we do. Um, <clears throat> so I think we should keep that in mind as we're going through the uh, comprehensive plan analysis is not just the work of, you know, putting together the plan. There's a lot of work that's wrapped up in all of this as well. Um, and uh, just to say, I think, um, you know, it was a good group. Uh, they had a lot of great comments, a wide range of expertise that I think each was very valuable in contributing to this plan. And I know, you know, many of them are still engaged to this process. And so I hope they come and continue to participate.
Thank you. Um, I guess if there's any um, questions or comments here, um, I don't know, Jonathan, if you had anything to add to be on the stop, but see wrap up or see pack. No, I mean, it's it was a great experience um, just <clears throat> walking through this process with the CPAC group. Um, I, there was a lot of learning and growth together, it seemed. Um, just also just learning the community um, and, and knowing what the community needs are. We had a bit of a hiccup with the engagement approach at first, and I think their insight and, and input has been valuable as, as well as the planning commissions in that front in terms of engagement. So ensuring that there's equitable engagement going forward. Um, and yeah, so I think they've been really instrumental in shaping the comp plan as it is before you right now. Um, and I hope they stay engaged, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Um. I think I would add just for the record, <clears throat> number five, I think the city does a really great job at that. So <laughs> I hope that that's reflected as keep it up, yeah. doing a great job. Excellent. All right. Um, anything else before we move on to our next steps section? All right. So our next steps, um, we have a lot of content to get through over the next um, you know, month and a half or so before the final recommendation um, on the plan. Um, so what you have in front of you today is, again, that introduction text that we walked through in detail, as well as a full list of the goals and the policies, as well as some of those suggested implementation items uh, for the comprehensive plan. Um, we would love for you guys to take a look at both of these documents um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, the introduction text, um, as noted before, um, getting those comments back on July 15th um, would be great. Um, and that gives us time to review those comments and come back for any last discussion um, at the July 22nd meeting. Um, but we do have a bit more time on reviewing those goals and policies. Um, so in the goals and policies, we have incorporated um, all of the comments we've heard from CPAC as well as Planning Commission on all eight elements of the comprehensive plan. Um, there is a, you know, a large effort to um, ensure that comments from Planning Commission have been incorporated as new policy, incorporated into existing policy, or incorporated into potential action items. Um, and so as you read through um, you know, that list in front of you, um, you know, looking for um, how your comments have been um, reflected within the new document. Um, you know, across the board, um, what we heard is the, the desire to have more actionable statements and more um, assertive statements and more information about how things might actually be done. Um, so there's been a uh, definitely concerted effort um, to, uh, you know, have more um, actionable language uh, throughout the policies. Um, there's also, as you'll see in the document, there's a lot of information about how these policies relate back to each other. Um, it's, it wasn't, um, you know, as part of the review process, it wasn't necessary to have every topic mentioned in every single element. So instead, what we tried to do is make it really clear what, how some of these items tie together. You know, how does that orientation to transit tie into land use, housing, the environment, and transportation, and kind of tie those things together? Um, how does emissions tie together between capital facilities, utilities, and the environment and transportation? So you'll start to see um, some of those references on how these different um, elements uh, tie together. Um, and you know, the, what we're looking for from you is um, comments or thoughts on policy or action items um, that seem to um, not be addressed. Um, we've definitely, um, you know, included. Uh, Paul, um, all, all the policy um, recommendations um, that uh, we've heard from Planning Commission, but some of those, again, have been turned into um, other implementation items or other things to study in the future. 
Um, and then we would like to get those back um, by Monday, July 29th. Um, so that is, you know, a little less than a month to review um, that full list there. Um, and we will take those comments um, and uh, come back, as Jonathan said, in two sort of waves of additional discussion in August. Um, uh, Jonathan or Christy, do you have um, anything to add on this conversation about uh, policy review? I don't, unless there's any questions. I would also say we're going to be at it for two months. Um, your recommendation will, I, I've been getting dates really wrong, so pardon me. Um, I have like date dyslexia, but I believe September 9th. Yep. So we have roughly two months to review this um, final, the actual draft as it's all put together, so. Um, but there's there's a lot to get through. Yeah. I guess the only thing I'll add is you have the paper copies in front of you, but you'll also get emailed out a Word version. That way, if you have comments, um, you can make those and track changes. Um, so I think Shannon will send that during this meeting or after um, by tomorrow morning. Sorry, I seem to have all the questions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I understand correctly that um, you have a table and then there are some things in the table that are recommended that it's appropriate to be in the comp plan and then there are some things that are not appropriate for the comp plan but we still have a table of those things as like other places where they go elsewhere in planning documents. Y yes. So well, a little bit. So in, in front of you, you have uh, that matrix and you know, the first column has the key numbered. Um, the second column has the proposed goal and policy language. And that third comment with notes has a variety of information in it. Um, it has information on different call outs or definitions that could be added for the policies. It has information on how that policy might refer to other policies within different elements or perhaps within the same element. Um, it also has information on where policy has been added new since the last time you saw it. Um, so either because of planning commission recommendations recommendation or because of staff or CPAG recommendation. And it also has information on those potential strategies or implementation items. There are not potential strategies and implementation items for every single policy, um, just the ones where we have currently identified how that would be implemented. Some of which are conversations that have been uh, had with staff and others are suggestions or ideas we've received from CPAG or planning commission. Okay, so I feel like, um, and I can't remember any examples, I've forgotten, I apologize. Um, there have been elements where people have brought things up and we said, uh, maybe that's not appropriate to include in the comp plan, but maybe that's a policy or something else down the line. Is that reflected in this document? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and I think that the next uh, slide just has the same information, but more detail. Um, so, um, you know, you're receiving the introdu introduction of the goals and policies today. Um, introduction of comments revisions due back next Monday. Um, you can email them to um, Shannon. Um, uh, either scanned handwritten comments or comments and track changes. And then um, the goals and policies, um, those we will receive um, by July 29th. Um, the intention is to discuss any um, uh, discussion on the introduction of the July 22nd meeting and a discussion on the goals and policies and the elements at the August 12th and 26th planning commission meetings. Um, and then I think our last slide here is all of those dates. Um, so you don't have to remember them. Um, they're all written right here in front of us. Uh, so we have, again, this is the first of five planning commission meetings we have to review um, that final draft plan, um, really to wrap up that um, really iterative process we've had all spring um, to go through each of those different elements and have a really fine um, discussion on the policies. Um, so at our next meeting um, on July 22nd, um, there will be a review of the draft EIS. Um, we're aiming to get that published that week. Uh, so planning commission will get sort of a sneak peek on um, what's going on with the draft EIS. 
Um, and then um, again, as we said, going through the review process and the elements um, in two parts um, at our two August meetings, um, targeting uh, September 9th for that public hearing um, for the recommendation to city council. And then city council will start the review soon after that, um, aiming to get that all adopted by October uh, 16th. And then also you'll see here in the little blue boxes, these are um, some of the additional upcoming dates. Um, we are uh, going to city council on the 22nd um, to review, to give them an update on the uh, transportation, a couple of facilities and utilities elements, um, and then our draft plan and um, DEIS process. Um, so again, targeting that draft EIS for July 24th with the 30-day comment review process, um, holding that public meeting as we talked about at the beginning of the, of the meeting today um, on August 12th um, here in this room, um, and then um, it would be we would be reviewing the, the final draft EIS, the final EIS with the final plan with planning commission starting um, uh, October 16th. So, or starting. September 12th and then going to October 16th. So the plan and the draft EAS are kind of going on the same uh, timeline there through September and October. So any questions? Looks like we're good. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we try to put together an efficient process. Um, just knowing that you really did the, the hard work with reviewing the elements, um, goals, and policies. So now it's really about affirming your recommendations um, and the recommendation that CPAC forwarded um, and making sure that everything we've discussed over the past year um, is incorporated and there's nothing missing. Um, so that's the goal of this process. And then just to, to make a plug, in, in the presentation, I think in the packet prepared for tonight's meeting, in addition to the text, uh, goals and policies, and the text uh, introduction that you've received, and there was also a, a little slide deck that just as a high level has all the purpose statements and the goals for each of the elements kind of at a glance. So you can see them all right in front of you without going through this text heavy document we've just handed you. Um, and then in addition to that, there is um, a couple of examples um, with uh, sort of placeholder language of what the plan will actually end up looking like, um, sort of that visual um, element. Um, so if you want something fun to look at that isn't just a Word document, uh, you can go check those out. But with that, that's it. That's it? Okay. So. Looks like we're ready to move on to the next agenda item then. Uh, item number six, uh, CED update. All right, so this is just intended to give the Planning Commission an update on what we do in CED after we do a comp plan and after we do development regulations. Um, these are some of the um, highlights from last year of some of the projects that we've been doing that you see when you're um, driving around and you're curious to what's going on. So we just have a snapshot of um, permits that we did last year. So we have a breakdown of the number of pre-application conferences, building permits, electrical permits, 
Um, these are geared towards engineering and planning. There's also um, some other permits for public works, for instance, like water meters and those permits um, that we have a, a little bit of a hand in through CED as well. And last year we took over business licenses um, fully in CED department. So Shannon's actually um, taken that on of overseeing that process and trying to improve timelines of getting comments on each uh, business license, whether it needs land use review or the fire marshal to take a look at or whatever. So you can see we, we processed about 2,000 of those last year as well. And then next year, we'll have some more information as we took over, in addition, um, code compliance um, in CED. So previously, there were two code compliance officers that worked out of the police department. Um, those functions have been moved over to CED um, in an effort for us to work more comprehensively with um, addressing, um, I would say, all elements of code compliance um, the, way I, the way I look at it. So working in, hand in hand with the other departments, we have some longstanding code compliance issues that um, if you drive around, you may be familiar with some of these properties. Um, I'm hoping uh, we're doing an abatement tomorrow, as a matter of fact, which means the city goes in and we take care of something if you can't take care of it yourself. In saying that, we give people every opportunity to take care of what they need to take care of until we just get to a point where somebody doesn't want to take care of something um, and we're going to be more aggressive in making sure that it gets taken care of. We're also working on the former Red Onion site of getting that demoed and some other things. So some of these, yes, high visibility um, nuisances and, um, you know, I've got 16 cars. Um, they're all, they're all um, going to get fixed up for sure. But until they do, we're going to take care of that for you as well. And some of those other things. So. Um, the approach is um, let us help you take care of it, and when you can't, then mom steps in and dad steps in and they take care of it for you. Um, we have about 27 projects that we're going to highlight just briefly today going over these um, projects. Most, most of these projects involve land use review, um, civil review through our engineering department and building permits associated with them in some form for the most part. Um, we are also in the process of updating all of our um, online um, development permitting processes um, if it doesn't kill all of us in the interim. Um, it's been uh, very frustrating to say the least, but the intent is that it's going to be easier for an applicant. It's going to be easier to process and more timely through our departments as we review things. And the information is going to be more publicly accessible if somebody wants to go online and say, hey, on 236, I saw something. Let me go check that out and see. And it's going to give you a little snapshot of what's going on there and uh, where they're at in the process and those type of things in real time versus kind of how we do it now, which is we kind of jerry-rig it together and manually put information in, which may or may not be as current as we would like it to be. So that process will get better. Um, first one is 212th place, which was a planned un unit development on 212th that was done. Previously, um, the applicant is a gentleman, Brian Dadvar. He did a PUD development, eight single family houses. In addition, there's a creation of a park which has public access, um, a, a new street, and then there's also some protections for some uh, critical slope areas. 
They've actually broke ground on this. It's received final land use approval. There was what we call a pre-construction meeting that's held with our inspectors to hopefully get people off to a good start um, when they're starting to put the civil improvements in. And there's some issues right now with some stormwater um, that's trying to get worked out as we speak. So that's kind of where 212th is. 234th um, townhomes is a project that was developed um, and completed last year. Five uh, fee simple townhomes that were developed on um, um, 234th and uh, this project was completed in uh, 2023. Altair townhomes, another fee simple development. What fee simple is, is when you have attached housing you can subdivide these into separate legal lots. So instead of this being like an apart apartment complex where you couldn't sell each of these individually, each one of these units can be sold um, by itself as an actual separate legal lot of record, even though it's attached. So that's what that means. And stop me if um, I'm speaking jargon and you're like, what the hell is a fee simple? Um, lot type of thing. Um, so it's basically like a condo that's subdivided um, and includes the the land that it's sitting on. And usually there's, um, you know, covenants in a homeowners association that goes for any of the common areas. In these, in this, and so there is that too. In these, uh, for Landsverk, um, when they develop, they do a lot of um, for required open space, they do a lot of roof, rooftop patio areas. And so there's that. And then if you do decks and that, then those square footages are also included to meeting areas in these more dense developments where people have some type of outdoor space um, to, um, to have as part of um, their their home as well. This project was completed this past year. Um, I have a comment on that one. Yeah, sure. I think that's actually a picture of the one across the street from the mosque. Oh, yeah, it actually is. 11 South 50, or 50 it Avenue It actually West. is, you're yeah. correct. Well, yeah, imagine um, something similar on um, yeah. 50th Avenue West. You're yeah. exactly correct. Yeah, I thought they did a good job with the other one too, so. They have little backyards in the back, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ballinger Park um, is, I think, one of the best projects that was done by the city last year. This was uh, um, accessible playground for um, children, all ages, I guess. Um, I see a lot of adults out here playing as well, which is pretty cool, um, with their kids. And then uh, trail was included as part of this project that's also ADA accessible. So. How do you get to an accessible playground if you don't have an accessible trail from the parking area? So that was a big part of this. There's a lot of peat that was filled in Ballinger Park, um, just as a side note. So some of the development in Ballinger is quite tricky just because of the soils um, there. So there was a lot of work done to make sure to make sure that this was stabilized. Um, and this has been highly successful, um, I believe, as part of a planned park project that was in the works for quite some time. Um, and there were gr uh, grant funding associated with this as well, so it's uh, pretty cool. Uh, Cedar Park Townhomes is another proposed fee simple development. This is on 54th, this is part of where this, the um, Christian school um, was on 54th. The actual school site um, is uh, planned to be subdivided into 52 townhomes as part of this project. And then um, frontage improvements, a cul-de-sac, which forms a pedestrian connection um, in between 54th and 55th. So um, focus, um, since we have such limited pedestrian connection 
to getting to town center. We've been trying to focus on making those pedestrian connections, even where we don't have streets. So I want to go hang out at um, town center. When we get that developed out, then I have accessible routes to get there um, where I can walk or bike um, and get there more easily and not necessarily just on an actual street itself. Um, this project has received a land use approval, and so it goes land use approval, civil review, which is all the engineering stuff, and then building review for building permits. And this is under civil review currently um, addressing some stormwater issues that this project has. I just learned how to pronounce this gentleman's last name today. Actually, I think I pronounced it, mispronounced it when I went to city council. This is Kamenos short subdivision. So this was just a little two water where there's an existing house on lot one and they subdivided the, the back half of this property into a second lot. There is a building permit in for that. And then there are some frontage improvements for a sidewalk and curb and mm -hmm. such adjacent to this. So that will be coming. Um, Gustafson townhomes, you guys have probably driven past this on 56th Street. This was a project that was completed last year for, again, fee simple townhomes um, on this particular property. Six townhomes were developed and completed. Um, I believe that they've sold all of them as we speak. Maybe, maybe there's one left. I'm not sure, but. I think they've sold them all. Yeah, I didn't check more recently. Um, this is another killer project that was done that took a lot of resources. Um, it was a restoration, creek restoration project and habitat restoration project um, in that environmentally sensitive area on the north side of Lake Ballinger. So about 16 and a half acres of habitat restoration, the Army Corps of Engineer project working with the city, Fish and Wildlife, and other agencies. And you can see there was a whole host of removing invasive species and replanting. Um, and this is for um, wetland restoration, um, fish habitat and rearing areas and improving that and also making it um, accessible to the public and trying to do that in an environmentally sensitive way at the same time to provide public access back there, but realizing that this is unlike an, the active parts of Lake Ballinger, this is meant to be um, a very sensitive environmental area and um, hoping that the little plants here <laughs> that just got planted are doing well. I know that um, there's a lot of checkup on this area recently just because new plantings and making sure that they're, they're doing good on this particular area. You'll also um, see that there is a viewing platform with some trails getting to it on this side of the lake that's going to be going through a review process with the city and Department of Ecology to have an area that's not a fishing pier, there could be no fishing or whatever, but just a place to go out to and look over the lake um, ultimately. And that project again has a lot of environmentally sensitive, sensitive components to it. So trying to be very uh, conscientious of what type of trails are getting put down um, in there, how we're protecting all those um, rest restored areas as far as planting goes and how we're actually putting an overwater structure. So um, in that type of a process when we're building over the water, that would be not only the city but the Department of Ecology and Fish and Wildlife all having a hand in approving something like that. Terrace View Estates. Um, fee simple is the name of the game in 2023. You can see um, this um, is 18 townhomes um, that were approved in um, three separate buildings. And this is located on 52nd. And you can see that 
This is currently under construction. Um, this is on 56. This was what we call PNT. I'm not sure what PNT stands for, actually. I've made up words to go to fill in the blank, but they changed the name to 47th, uh, 47 North. You can see um, that the units that front 56 are live work. That's what it's intended. Hopefully some of those will turn into um, little working areas, but 16 units um, and then those five on 56 were, um, did I just say 50, 16 units, but the five are live work um, there and that project was completed um, in 2023 as well. Primera, this has been an ongoing um, project as uh, Deneen is probably more than aware of the ongoing um, efforts there. In 2023, there was work done on building four. These buildings have been renamed from numbers to um, names, so it's now Orcus. Um, and so work was completed on there. There was some work done around that retention pond that you can see improvements in the actual retention pond itself and then access to it um, with um, trails so people that work at Primera can go down there as well and use that as an amenity. And then you'll see building five, which is kind of disconnected um, from the rest of the development by topography. It sits at the top there um, that has um, been approved for a, uh, to be subdivided off of there. Um, and I believe they just finalized that short plat, which means that can allow that building to be um, sold separately for for use. That building has kind of just um, not been in use, I want to say the last three years or so-ish. Yeah, so um, that's kind of what's happened more recently at Primera. Terrace Station Building 3 tracks. Um, it is um, still under a temporary certificate of occupancy. So what that means is if there's areas of a building where everything's been done, that there's just some things that are not gonna affect life safety, then we can issue what's called a temporary certificate of occupancy. There's still a few little minor improvements that need to be done. They were waiting for um, one of their generators um, over 18 months. They got it today, as a matter of fact. Um, and then they have some signage um, that we would like them to complete just for parking, just to show people, hey, park this way if they're not familiar with the, with the buildings. And there's just some other things, but they are very close to wrapping it up. I think they're about 40% full um, is what we heard today as well. So um, areas of for commercial and retail on that bottom floor and then um, apartments on top of that for mixed use. Do we know how the um, commercial space is? Um, I don't know um, where they're at for tracks. Actually, I do know that we have a couple TIs, which is um, sh short for tenant improvements on building two. And I just heard today that there's a trampoline park thing. What's it called? Sky Zone. Um, going into building one, which is, I believe, um, about four or five weeks from grand opening. So get your birthday party plans ready so you can go to Sky, whatever the heck it is. But um, so building two uh, is a brew, kind of a brew pub, I believe, and a coffee shop is going into building two. I'm not sure about building three as of now. So they're starting to, starting to fill. Valorum Cottage Homes um, is another Landsberg project that was completed last year. 
um, cottage homes. We've, I think we've had a lot of conversation about um, that maybe the intent of what we originally envisioned needs to be um, re-examined. Nonetheless, there were 10 units that were done as part of this development. Project was completed um, and was highly successful in terms of being occupied very quickly. Um, Willow Glen townhomes, another fee, fee simple townhome project. Um, it built two of these buildings um, have been finished and are available. As I know, there are six buildings in total. And um, like I said, I believe um, two rows of the buildings have been approved under building permits for, for final occupancy and um, they will be finished up here in um, this year, all the buildings. Candela, this is a development that is immediately east of the light rail station. Um, which is where they're demoing that temporary parking lot right now. So um, this project, eight stories, multifamily commercial um, development, it has received land use approval, civil review. I believe um, we have actually gotten there for the most part. Um, Sound Transit was responsible for removing the temporary parking lot and so that's what you see right now and then once that's done building permits are ready to issue and you'll see work start on um, this project here next to the light rail station can i just make a comment on that one sure how how did they make a pencil with only 5000 square feet of retail right next to the transit center so here under zoning, they're not required to do any um, retail under the regulations. I actually um, agree with you. I think it's kind of foolish not to have more retail. Um, most of these buildings pencil just fine without any retail. It's usually a local jurisdiction requiring Banks and uh, most developers would like to do all residential if possible. So um, they've elected to have a couple of retail spaces, yeah, but it's not a whole lot. And I think if retail was done right here in this location, I don't see how it's not a money maker, but um, I always wanna do business plans for some people. So <laughs> just <laughs> of like how they could make more money or, I think it just could be a real asset um, right here. And as we're probably going to get a fourth building for Terra Station and you're going to have the foot traffic and just the vehicle traffic right here and one of the entrances to the city downtown, I just think if you put the right things here, I don't see how that doesn't work for you. So but, what could we do in our planning process? Um, we could require that? it. So we're reviewing the economic analysis again. What, when the original town center plan was reviewed, it used to be that we required all ground floor commercial all throughout town center. And with the changes in retail, um, eco the economic folks came back and said, you guys are over retailed and you're never going to fill all that retail space. So you can require it, but what you're gonna end up doing is having a bunch of vacant retail spaces. And I think we've all kind of seen that in other um, communities that you go into where retail was kind of required on all ground floor and it remains vacant. So part of our conversation and going through that planning effort was focusing retail in certain areas while allowing it in other areas. So where do we want that? So that was the new 57th commercial spine and in other areas of town center on um, corners and um, um, just specific areas of these, these kind of areas. And so you don't get over retailed. I think you can kind of see um, economics is residential leads retail. 
And so when retailers are looking for establishing a business, they're always looking for how many folks are in a certain proximity for me to put a business there. That's why we're having a hard time with a grocery store right now, um, particularly in, in our area, and then also kind of the competition around. And so it is, as soon as we start to see more residential being built, then we're gonna start seeing a lot of those commercial areas that would otherwise sit vacant kind of fill up. But there's also a max to that um, under the current thinking with as many people that are buying online and doing those other activities where it's not, you know, maybe how I grew up where and how I still like to um, go to the store and look at things. But, you know, that's that the demographics have shift and how people do things has shifted as well. So that's the same for land use. It's like trying to look at those shifts in commercial and we certainly want vibrant, active, filled spaces where we do have commercial and not just kind of sitting there vacant all the time. So I think it's kind of a, a toss up. I guess in my mind, I see this area as kind of the... yeah welcoming to Mount Lake Terrace. And so by not having enough retail there, somebody on the light rail goes by and says, oh, there's not a whole lot here. Yeah, no reason yeah. to get off. Yeah. Right. So to me, that this particular area should almost, and I, I can see where obviously mandating full ground level is not going to pencil out or it doesn't do anybody a favor. Right. But 5,000 square feet on a, what is that, probably 30,000 square foot plate, floor plate? Yeah, I, I don't you know, have is, the specific. It's a very small yeah. amount in my mind, at least for that area. Yeah, it is small. I mean, there's two kind of smaller retail areas on this development for sure. Yeah. Wow. And ground floor. So, I mean, I think that's something we can talk about again as we get more information that's being worked on by Leland, who's doing um, uh, economic, some economic planning in conjunction with the housing that they've worked on on the comp plan to kind of see where they're, they're heading as well. Can I soapbox about that for a second? Um, so I think this actually, like this view doesn't look too bad because you've got the ground floor retail like facing the street and if you actually stand in the transit center, it looks like we're sort of facing a bunch of walls and like I think we're gonna have to fix that in the future. Um, where I think we should have our hair on fire a bit is the other view of this, looking back from the park, where we had the opportunity to do development standards on the park edge. We, for various reasons, did not do them. And so now we've got, it's not a blank wall facing the park, but like at least, you know, somebody could have like walked into the park. I don't think it's like an emergency quite so much with this building because there's a big, you know, hill back there, but I do think for the rest of the park, before the, the other site develops that's facing this park, like we really need to look at that very carefully and quickly because I do think if we have a bunch of, if it's like the back side of the building is facing the park, I think we have failed. So something to keep in mind. I'm, I'm just curious real quick for vehicular access, is it primarily off of 236 or is it off? Yeah, of so it's it's off of 236, but um, at, at, on the very east side of the building. So it's kind of going off the screen as you go away from underground parking with access um, separated from, this is, um, called the limited access area under Washington State Department of Transportation. They control this intersection, actually. Um, and so the idea is to space those road cuts. And so their access is as far as it can be from the transit center, which makes sense because we're adjacent to what will be the trail coming out to 236 from the park. Um, and then you'll have the bus loop right there as part of the transit center. There is, um, you can't really see it, but in between, the, this is one, it's two spires on what is technically a single building because it's on the same building plate, but there's two separate spires. And in between them is, you have to have emergency access. Um, and so there will be some emergency access that loops there. It's not for any vehicles 
Um, and then there's a area that will be constructed as well that um, is vegetated and provides plants and kind of a little terraced area out there as well. But um, all the parking for the commercial and residential will be on that east side underground. So, and that's requirement for the majority of uses in town center when we're talking about any of these multi-story mixed use developments, it's underground parking. So this is not an exception. Sound transit conditional use permit. My favorite project so far for the last seven, nearly seven years. Um, we are getting close to what's called revenue service, which is the opening of the light rail station. August 30th is our date. So we are, um, like all these projects, scrambling till the very last second uh, that we possibly can to get all these improvements done around the community. So there's multiple sites. This is the light rail station. But as you guys know, we have multiple sites around the community. So we've divided this project up right now for um, certificate of occupancy and making sure all the conditional use um, conditions are met into a uh, three-phased temporary certificate of occupancy. One, for the work they're doing now. Two, all the things they need to do prior to revenue service. And three, are some of the improvements that won't be able to be done due to various factors like half street road improvements um, in some area. Nothing next to the, the actual, this station, but some other things that need to be, um, sureties need to be put in place and such. So we're working on this every week um, as we go, uh, mainly community development and um, engineering we're all working and building um, on getting this project over the finish line um, to get revenue service open on the 30th. There's going to be a big soiree um, for all the stations to open in Shoreline, Linwood, um, and Mount Lake Terrace. The Secretary of Transportation's coming out, a bunch of dignitaries, and the whole the whole schmear will be going on. So plan your calendars accordingly, but that's the date. Aces poker. Um, this was, um, you can see up top that I believe there was just bingo here. Um, Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody remembers. Um, when I got here, it was kind of, nothing was there except some bingo going on. Um, and so this was renovated um, in 2023 into Aces Poker. Um, so as much as I know about gambling, which is not a lot, um, this is like what they call an enhanced card room. So no slots. And I believe they still do bingo if I'm not mistaken, but they have a bar and a dining room and kitchen, et cetera, in here. I've never been inside the development, but on the exterior, they did a bunch of exterior improvements um, and brought this up to code as well, so. I've never been inside either, but it's right across the street from Primera. Yeah. So, and the long and long ago, it was a casino. Oh, I, was and it? And I think that probably didn't, wasn't sustainable since there was two others two on Two others side. just, yeah. Boop, boop, yeah, they're yeah, all on so 220th. It a, a bingo place. Yeah, so that's all I knew is that there was bingo going on at night. So anyways, they they brought poker and stuff back and um, did a bunch of um, interior and exterior renovations on this place. Um, Mount Lake Village, this is the Rogers Market site. Um, this is a project that we've been reviewing for quite some time there are, it's basically there's street frontage on all four sides of this building. So there's a lot of civil improvements and we have worked fairly hard on the design of this project. 
um, for various things as well. Um, there is some, again, this is one of those projects where it doesn't have to be fully commercial, but it does on the two corners facing 236 have to have some commercial components to it. And so this does include that um, on in those areas. And we've, I believe, made two official rounds of comments on this and this is getting ready to come back into the city with um, some revisions on the land use in civil. Um, and then we've worked with Makers Architecture on the design, um, which we bring those uh, makers in for any of what I call these really important foundational projects of where we're kind of setting the design standard for some of these key buildings going into town center of where we want to focus on really good design um, and um, bring in um, folks that work in that arena um, consistently. So they've been helping us review that as well. Yes. Yeah, so we do administrative design review at the city and we always have. Um, and I may think I'm an architect, architect and designer, but I'm not. Um, I have pretty strong opinions on it, but just making sure that we actually have professionals that are helping us do that as well. Or like, hey, this is why they need to do it structurally or other things besides, oh, that's ugly. I hate that. You know, those type of comments that I make. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so they're held as a, a sub consultant, or a consultant to the city, and they do yeah. most of our design. How often are they engaged? Out of curiosity, um, it just depends. I usually have them help us. So for the Candela project, I brought them in. For the fourth building um, that went through a pre-app for um, Terra Station, I had them comment mm. on the pre-app. Good. on this yeah. so when i feel like hey this is important and we really need to get a little bit of extra help then we then we call on those guys to help us out yeah. i'm glad we've got some people looking over that because building four of terra station is also going to be really important too yep um also just on this project like just kind of as a heads up for everyone on this commission um when i talk to people about the development that's happened regardless of how good it is i think the comment is going to be Oh no, we replaced our grocery store with not a grocery store. Yeah. So um, we need to have an answer for that. But yeah. But you know, we're making the not grocery store as good as it can be, I think. And then I'm really glad to see that they're looking at those gateway buildings. Yeah, I think it's hard. And I've talked to the grocery store ladies, as we affectionately call them, and other people. And I realize people want a grocery store. Um, again, it is. We allow grocery stores here in this zoning. We, we can get the zoning in place. We can try to entice that and make that happen. But at the end of the day, you can't make somebody do it, right? So you can make a choice to say, only a grocery store can go here. That, that is a choice. And then that would have to sit and, not, and Jen tell somebody builds a grocery store or you can say, we can allow grocery stores in these zones, which it is allowed. Um, and um, I think that's where we're getting to the point too of having some additional help with economic development because it's like all of our plans and we've talked about this even with our goals and policies. We can have goals and policies and we can have a lot of great ideas, but you also have to have time and expertise to implement some of these things. And that's really the crux of everything, right? Is until you have somebody dedicated that's out there hustling to bring people into the city to be like, this is what we got going. We've got these plans in place. We've already done the environmental review for you. It's, you know, easy peasy. How can we make these things happen that it just becomes difficult with staffing and I call it your day job, you know, development review and then the other stuff we're doing. Some of those things fall to the wayside and so you, you hit a certain threshold where you just need people to come in and help you do some stuff. 
Yeah. So, you feel like you have the resources for that? No. Um, okay. I've asked um, City Council to think about getting an economic development person in full time to help with those things. It's actually an economic development person, not somebody like me that knows enough to be dangerous, but somebody that actually knows economic development and is versed on it. And that's the type of people that you need. When we had Stephen Clifton as deputy uh, city manager, that was his background. And so I could tag along with him and do things, um, but you really need somebody proactively going out and marketing your city. When I ask other people on council or whoever um, for resources for this, this will probably be a prime example of where not having that has had, like we could have improved. Yeah, that. potentially, so think, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Or at least you get um, to the point of where you know specifically what you need to do in order to do that. So then you work on going out there. That's exactly what Mill Creek did, is they got the residential, they built the residential and they kept poking at it till they got their grocery store. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like that stuff, but you gotta be proactively doing that all the time to make it happen. Yeah, and this is also reflected in CPAG comments of where community outreach, like I think this is contained with that umbrella, within that umbrella sure. of needing to develop those relationships between the city and the development community and the people who live here. And so um, yep. let us know when you need to ask for more money. Yeah, so we're doing budget right now and I've asked. Um, and so that's gonna be one of the decisions that, um, um, council needs to make and you know other people are asking too and that's you know the hard part of leadership and um revenue and all those good things that they have to weigh when you know um you're taking a look at the budget and stuff but in order to make to take the next step i really feel like that it's something that we need to do so that's kind of where we're at right now with that but in the meantime you know, um, we try to do that as part of our everyday um, uh, workload that we have in CED as well, of meeting with people and talking to them and um, doing those things, so. Is like, so some of that attached back to my previous question though? It, it yeah. It doesn't, so not all buildings are built to suit. A lot of buildings are speculatively built also. So like at, Terrace Station, obviously 24-Hour Fitness may have been part of their, you know, they may have already been in the discussions when they designed the building, but yep. probably not. Um, they were actually. They were? Okay. Yeah, so actually that's that's not ne necessarily typical though. Yeah. So you're it, exactly it, and so, right. And so that it would goes be back. spec space and those can and get so bigger And so by requiring and a certain amount, you know, by knowing what is, what type of store do we want to bring into the city? Right. What type of floor plate do, does that, you know, store require in their design standards? And then how do we then incorporate that maybe into yeah. maybe even sub area planning to say like, hey, in these areas, we would like to attract a store. Therefore, any development over certain size must have this criteria yeah. so that we can attract that store. Because if we see more of this going on and what happens at Candela we're not going to get a store. Yeah, and that and that could very well be, you know, that that could very well be a conversation. So, I think it gets to be pretty complex because um, these are multi-million dollar buildings, which it's your jaw drops when you hear like how much this is and what a lot of people don't realize is once you see something actually built in um, that has risen from the ground when they're doing all the pre-planning and then you're going through all the permitting, then you're going through all the, them getting the money and the financing and then the construction. These are multi-year projects in the making. Um, and it's not just like, oh, well, the permits took me so doggone long time. 
I think we're actually doing pretty good permitting wise um, in Mount Lake Terrace and we've been really focusing on that. It's just all of it together because a lot of these builders are going, hey bank, can you give me hundreds, uh, you know, so many millions of dollars, uh, $75 million to do this? Can you give me, uh, you know, $250 million? Um, yeah, so it's just kind of, um, it's crazy money um, that people are putting up to, like you said, in a lot of cases, do speculative building of where a lot of times these ground floor commercial, you don't have anybody in place. Even Terra Station, they have a retail person that is actively going out marketing their spaces and we've seen how long it's ta taken to fill those up. Um, and Bree Telcamp is their person and she's known in this region for being really, really good. So I think it's just part of the struggle of COVID, um, a glut of office space. So, you know, it, all that, the regional stuff also affects us too, right? Um, of where you see Seattle starting to talk about um, converting a lot of their office and retail space into residential. And so, you know, these things aren't static um, and these markets change, but then you're also talking about a lot of a lot of money. So it's kind of where we're at. So I I think you know these renderings you know bring up another good example. You know it's like okay yeah we focus you know on the corners, but you have whole block faces here where it's a potential dead zone. Mm -hmm. And you know this is. You know, this is kind of on the northern edge of right. know, sort of our town center area, but it's still our town center area. And a comment I made years ago when Vineyard Park came in, I was like, that whole south face is just a dead zone because it's just parking and in their vehicle access. Mm -hmm. And that's like completely inappropriate for what we want to see for our town center. Um, you know, here it's not ne it's not necessarily parking. It's probably going to be, you know, retail. It's kind of hard to tell if. You know, it's, it's kind of a mix of residential um, and there's that retail on 232nd, but the back side of the building um, is in fact uh, where there is parking, I mean parking access that is, you know, coming into the structure and there's like some corner um, amenities there for, um, I'm trying to think how it, this project's, like um, a gym on the back side. You know, it's kind of glass, but there is some mm -hmm. um, um, more kind of associated with the parking on that back side, a little bit of blank wall, which we've required them to enhance aesthetically and other things. But yeah, it's very tricky. Um, when we're talking one of these buildings, because one of the things is you do have to have areas where people ac you know, have access to the building to park um, and to do you know, those things as well. So how we can do those uh, more aesthetically pleasing. So there has definitely been a focus, but this is one of those buildings where you can decide whether you wanna do ground floor residential or you want to do commercial except on the two um, southern corners on uh, 232nd there and um, you know how to make it as aesthetically pleasing as you can just because particularly on the south side of this building that kind of is the cap of what would be town center currently right. So we tried to focus a lot on that side of the building particularly. So I hope it's better than what we did previously, but it's just, it's definitely a struggle. Is, is there a way, you know, if when it's a case where the building itself is really presenting a dead zone and yeah, we can say, okay, we want you to do something unique or more attractive. So it's just not a blank wall, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it's, there isn't that draw to get pedestrian 
traffic there they're you know they're just right. gonna are just by. gonna avoid it you know you walk walk down certain blocks downtown seattle you, you, you know when yep. when those but you get that same feeling you just you don't want to be there there's just there's nothing engaging it's it's a it's like kind of like a, a canyon so to speak is there a way when it's like that sort of dead zone has to occur just for the design of the building is there something that the city can do sort of in the right-of-way portion to sort of do extra enhancements to try and encourage pedestrian throughput <laughs> through there so it's just not this wasted? Yeah, I mean, there has space. been an effort along with this design to do what's called an amenity zone. So it's not just trees there, but it's also um, benches and areas um, really taking a look at um, um, one of my least favorite things in the city is all the utility boxes that are on the corner of 236 and 56. Um, and <laughs> yes, um, and you would be shocked at how hard it is to work <laughs> with the PUD sometimes. And I say that lovingly, Doug, but it's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, we have those things where you know, we're trying to have a very walkable, aesthetically pleasing downtown, and that that in, in encapsulates a lot of all of those little things add up to a lot, and so we're working on those continuously. Of like, and and even with town center, what I said when we were amending that plan is we need to come back and amend it again. There's gonna be things that work and things that don't work. And then, you know, um, we need to improve those. So there's gonna be some stuff after we road test it. And this is gonna be for the comp plan as well, where what we thought we were trying to achieve maybe didn't work out what we wanted to do and we need to go back in and make it better. So. I think there's a few things that we can make better on this too, so. Oh, looking at the flowers. Okay. Have we beat Mount Lake Village to death? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is gonna be your favorite chain link express car wash. <laughs> my teeth. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, chain link, um, this thing um, is still under land use review. We have some design standards as far as transparency and other design requirements that are still getting worked out on. Um, the car wash, but it is under the zoning, which is community business, which has been around for a long time. A car wash is an allowed use. So technically by zoning, um, somebody can put a car wash in here. Seems like an efficient piece of land to be, it's, it looks like long and skinny. Yeah, it's kind of what, long and skinny. Else, <laughs> the only other thing would be storage and I personally don't want to see any more storage yeah. in this area, so. so. <laughs> I, I do have a question on this though. I, I you know, uh -huh. I noticed that, you know, they've, they've already demoed the building and they've cleared the lot. Uh -huh. Um, in part of that lot clearing was a pretty significant tree. Um, is, are, how do I word this? Um, obviously they're still through review right now and you know, any, you know, anything can happen. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I'm sure there's a lot of sunk costs in this, so they're not going to walk, walk away willingly from this project. But in case, you know, something like that were to happen, is it, should it be allowed that they can clear the lot ahead of time before they know they have permit in hand? So um, it, it, technically the way our code works right now, and we are kind of slowly reviewing all of our tree requirements, you have to have, I believe, up to six significant trees. So even like on this site or your personal property, if you wanted to go cut a tree down that wasn't classified as like a heritage tree, you could go cut a tree down anytime you wanted. So unless the city 
um, does a really comprehensive tree ordinance um, and you have to get a permit for every tree kind of you cut and that's you know kind of a decision that needs to be made then yeah they could go in and cut a tree down so in this case they haven't done anything illegal that I'm aware of Oh, no, no, I wasn't yeah. suggesting that. No, it was but illegal. I'm just, just saying that, that they, they, they would need a permit it. for, in other words, right, that they're, they would be in violation of the code or anything. Yeah. So this is Chain Lake. Uh, 236 Street Vacation. This was a street vacation. This is where there is a potentially planned building for for Terra Station on that corner which is Kitty Corner from uh, Light Rail, which is across the street from Candela, which is across Van Rye Boulevard in what will be the city's new pedestrian plaza. Um, they did a pre-application conference um, for a mixed-use building on this site, um, and I think they're assessing um, moving forward on a potential building for right now, it looks like kind of a big hole, just like the other side of the street. And that'll be separated by like a green space there, right? Uh, the building between tracks in that building. Yeah, there's some um, wetland areas no, that nice. had to be mitigated, um, some habitat areas and such. And so those remain, yep, those can't be touched, but. Yep. I have a question about this, two questions about this project. Um, is it on both sides of 237th, if you were to continue the line of 237th to Van Rye? 237th. Yeah, 237th, one block south oh. of 236? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Well, it's Monday. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, 237th would come, potentially come down and feed this. But again, there would need to be a lot of work done in order for that to happen. Okay. So they had a couple of scenarios where they were coming off the, there, there's a, they own a house, they own a couple of those houses that would need to be removed. And then where is the appropriate access? Is it off of 236 and it's um, right out only? Do you come down 37th? So that's a lot of um, discussion for engineering, how something like that would work. Or do you come out on Van Rye potentially? Okay, um, and would 237th like as a, maybe not a right of way, but a public space then continue from Van Rye over to 237th? I, I don't think that's been decided yet, but okay. there's been some different conversations. Okay, I think they should do that. And I also think it would be a mistake to rebuild it for cars. It's a lot of work. And I think it would also make the traffic more complicated, but. Yeah, I think this whole area is complicated. Yeah. You know, if you start thinking light rail, and then you start thinking Candela, and then you start thinking a potential development on this site there. Yeah, that can, this yeah. is going to be a little crazy. Yeah, so I heard a rumor maybe somewhere that maybe punching 237 through was considered or maybe there was discussion or maybe it was something I dreamed. But, yeah, um, I don't think it's gotten to that level of conversation. Okay. I think it, it's been really kind of tentative about some different scenarios. Okay, well, um, I would like to see 237 continue as a public space, but for pedestrians and not for yeah. cars, if possible. Yeah, and I also think it depends on because, um, as um, Clark was saying, you're you also have some protected areas in between there. So, and you guys know that that topography is like crazy. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot to consider. But this was just um, vacation of some of that right away. Cool. Um, that was done. Forest Crest Athletic Club, um, they've been doing a lot of work out there, as you guys know. Um, we have a proposal in for the actual athletic club this year, but they also have been doing short subdivisions and different things out there. This is currently a three lot that was submitted last year. 
Um, I think it's going to be revised and going to turn into a six lot. And the reason for that is um, they could do up to nine lots with what's considered a short plat, which is administratively reviewed by the city versus a hearing examiner process. But they're rethinking their tennis courts um, for pickleball because we all know pickleball is like the rage. Um, and so they're kind of... Um, reassessing the use of their current property. So stay tuned. Um, this could change. 52nd Landing. Um, again, we have a development that ground floor commercial, um, which all of the ground floor is actually commercial in this particular case, um, community business. And so it's required to have all um, ground floor commercial, there is parking allowed um, in this community business district, and then there is uh, um, three stories of um, residential on top, and this is currently under land use review as we speak. Is this right at the corner? No, this is right next to... Um, it's Kitty Corner from the 7-Eleven, um, and there's a little strip mall that has a teriyaki, do I want to say a nail place? Okay. Yeah, it's like it should have an Edwards Jones, a nail salon, and some type of small restaurant in it is like all these strip malls. And, and it's right adjacent to that. It's that particular piece of property. So it's fenced right now, I believe, with the chain link fence. I know that the old Chinese restaurants had a lot of um, break-ins and a lot of people hanging out. And um, so this all got like fenced out. Um, fenced. So this is the, the Chinese restaurant? No, it's oh. behind it. Oh, I thought that was That's that cleared. That townhome development that we saw That's earlier. Across the street. That's across the street. Yeah, that's over here. Yeah, so that's 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 that oh, the town, oh, so the townhome is behind the 7-Eleven. Townhome's yeah. behind the 7-Eleven. This is across the street. Gotcha. Yep. So both of those two um, vacant pieces of property. Um, one of them's actually getting developed right now, and the, um, this one is under land use review. So, so it's it, go ahead. I was going to say, so it's possible with this might be a catalyst for the corner in like the Chinese restaurant to maybe then... Yeah. Develop and and maybe even on the other side of the Chinese restaurant because I'll tell you that that complex oh, used to be a no go area when I was yeah yeah <laughs> when I was growing up we knew you, you, you don't uh, go down there <laughs> I would uh, yeah I would be shocked that somebody can bring the Chinese restaurant back from the grave um, a couple people yeah. have tried yeah. but if if you've poked your head around there that is rough. Yeah, I, I, I mean, even when it was still, quote, you know, a Chinese yeah. restaurant, I think the business was the bar, you know. Or yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the restaurant. It that, was, that's it, what I've heard. It, yeah. It, it, it was the bar, but I think this is even more important why, you know, kind of the sub area planning. Yeah. Looking at this area and really hardly considering, you know, an up zone there because the demand is there and the catalyst is, is coming. And I think it would be a missed opportunity if we, you know, if we didn't do the examination that we're doing right now. Right. And I, I think area. even prior to sub area, I think this is part of comp plan for our land use map, right? Where we're talking, hey, is this a mixed use center? Is this a neighborhood center? What does that look like? Um, this community business is a zone that was part of town center way back when. Um, and this really hasn't, this business district hasn't been looked at in years. So I think that's part of what we're, what we're going to accomplish with the comp plan and then the development regulations is we can even do that pre sub area, um, planning, because like I said, I think we need, my opinion is we need to start looking at these centers as kind of our basis for sub-area planning. I think it just makes sense, but something to think about. Yeah, I don't really pay attention to what's on the corner now, but back in the day, it was video 52. Oh, really? I just I just know it was like a teriyaki place, and like I, 
Yeah. There's yeah. a nail salon. On yeah, there's the always been like a laundromat and something. Laundromat. Like a laundromat. Oh, okay. Back, back yeah. in the day. Okay, exactly. there you go. There was a video Isaac store, knows. Video yeah. rental place there. Okay. What's across the street from, it's across the street from 7-Eleven. Um, is that ours? No, that's okay. Linwood. Dang it. I figured that might be the case. Thank you. Yeah. Way back in the day, it used to be a gas station. That yeah. Had, I mean, yeah, it was decommissioned. I don't even remember it actually ever being an active gas station. Yeah, um, when I moved in, it was a decommissioned gas station. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In gas stations. Um, uh, again, I'll not um, dilly dally. Uh, Tiburon Townhomes, another fee, simple development. We're on 54th Street here. A little four unit um, townhome development proposed that's under land use review. Um, uh, promenade um, is off of 56. So this is the now kind of vacant property that's next to the mosque. So there was a previously approved development called Promenade um, um, on the site that was done more in conjunction with the mosque. This is somebody else doing a development. It's in the town center three, which is um, uh, one of the zones in town center proposing this five-story um, um, residential development um, um, on that particular piece of property. So this is currently under land use review and um, out for comment from engineering and fire and everyone. And we have heard some public concerns just with the development of this particular piece of property. So, what kind of concerns? Um, I think that it's actually getting developed. Oh, just oh. frankly, yeah. <laughs> it's the one with the house on the single. Yeah, it's a single yeah. house right oh, now. There was some other stuff property. that got demoed previously. I don't know, two or three years ago, but in this new proposal, it seems to be more significant than what the previous proposal. Yeah, um, the performa on that, there was a reason it really didn't ever get built. Is it just didn't pencil? So if somebody came in with their own money, which was I think the intent through the mosque, mm -hmm. then something like that could have been developed with financial help, but. Um, all of those land use permits expired and nobody was willing to take it over and purchase it um, to do to do that. So um, this is the new proposal. Uh, Tiny Treasures is a child care center that um, is being proposed on 44th. Um, this uh, project has had some um, issues, most notably just trying to fit the daycare center on there and having adequate ingress and egress and parking on the site because of child care centers. You have those peak morning and peak evening drop off and pick up. And so we've been trying to work with the applicant on this. Um, to um, try to get additional parking for some employees so we could have additional parking for um, drop off and pick up of this particular site. So we've been working on this for a little while. Um, up to 70 um, children would um, be accommodated. Um, Terrace Court Town Homes is a newer uh, proposal that we received in 2023. This is also 11 units. There um, was some design issues that needed to be figured out um, and we're still going through that process. And this is also under land use review. This is uh, two, two single family lots currently on 230th that they're proposing 11 fee simple lots and then access would be behind these buildings. Veterans Memorial Parks, um, there's two projects. In 2023, we approved the trails. So these trails have been planned as part of the light rail improvements of where improving the trails through the park for accessibility to the transit center um, and through here. So having lit 
um, more accessible um, ADA standard trails and pathways as much as possible to make some of those connections to Civic Campus and to the park and then to the light rail station. So this received land use approval. Um, working out the civil review on this, which I believe is really close, and then issuing permits. There's also um, a new proposal for Veterans Park, which is the next proposed phase, which is improving the front um, part of the park, so providing restroom, um, improving the play equipment in the area to make um, it more user friendly and um, having more eyes on the ground and more use at the park for families, which I think is really needed. So there's effort um, to make those improvements um, in addition to the trails. So that's being worked on and you'll see that coming forth this next year. Thanks. Oh, and that's, that's the last one. Um, any additional questions? You guys have a staff? Yeah, I actually had one for this tiny treasures. Okay. Oh. Childcare. So that's a, that's a tight site. Yep. <laughs> um, and then that would be then putting a third driveway really close to the intersection there. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it can be tough enough trying to pull out going north um, from there. And I can imagine people dropping off their kids need to go north and south. Yeah, so I think as far as I know, it's gonna be right out only, is yes. that correct? Um, this actual, that is 44th is controlled by the city of Linwood. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they are making comment on that, but you're exactly correct. Access, particularly those peak times, that is always the concern for childcare. There needs to be more child care. Um, uh, it is a desired need in every community that I'm aware of. There's a lack of it, mm -hmm. but it is a very tight site, no, no doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, for context for all of the new residents of the city, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is only a vacant lot still because the, the property owners at the time were just requesting way too much money uh, for the development on the corner when that was being developed. They they wanted to buy this lot as well. And the the property owners, um, I think, had an overinflated opinion of what their land was actually worth. Developers really wanted it, but they were like, absolutely not. They weren't going to pay that ridiculous amount now. Obviously, in 2024 dollars, that sounds like <laughs> chump change. But back Back when all of this stuff was happening, that was that was quite a bit of money. It was it was quite ridiculous, and it was a shame because it what could have been a substantial development on that corner ended up just being basically a, a nicer looking strip mall, and it, and, it, and it could have been something a little bit better. So that's that's a little frustrating. And then now it's been an empty lot for decades. Yeah, <laughs> because of that. So yeah, so that's kind of where that's at. So all of those issues are trying to get worked out on this as well. Any other questions? So over here, is this gonna just be another gas station again across from, uh, what are we calling that? Terrace, something like there or something. Another gas station. Right here, that's next to the coffee shop, a special bar. Oh, um, I'm not sure what's uh, going on there. Okay. Yes. I but in the gas station even open since that's technically an auto-oriented business in the town Yeah, so I mean, it basically businesses. in town center, once it is vacant for a certain amount of time, then it would have to be brought up to code. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I would say no. Um, but we haven't really heard what's going on in that piece of property, or at least I haven't. Okay. So... It's a separate ownership from kind of the rest of a lot of that. So. This is all in 2023? Yeah, this is uh, not all, but, you know, some of the projects, yeah. I remember that you're being much shorter. Um, <laughs> good, 
Is it, that the post COVID? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, good, good job. I do think, um, you know, we are starting to see things improve and people are, you know, filling in vacant buildings and vacant lots. And like, I think, you know, there's been a lot of work done with that. And um, the example I think I brought up was the, the old dental clinic that's off the inner urban trail behind uh, Ranch 99. And I've seen they're going to open like a daycare in there at some point. And considering it's in a floodplain, I thought it was kind of an impossible site to develop, was my guess. Um, but somehow I have seen, like, you know, and given the length of time it was vacant, but like I've seen, you know, like that seemed like a hard site to permit. And so I think, you know, there's, it seems like there's a lot of work being done in the city and yeah. we're seeing improvements. And so I appreciate it. Thanks. Like destination city. All right. I'll, I'll complete my jabbering and um, I'll talk metal housing. Oh, okay. All right. Good evening. Hello. Again. Um, Just for the record, we are now moving on to item number seven. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Um, in interest of time, I'm going to be brief. So. I can, okay. So I wanted to, um, as we presented at our last um, presentation on June 10th, I believe, um, we were going to bring forward a policy worksheet that we'll have you work on um, for comment. So the goal of this presentation is a brief presentation just going over the expectations of that worksheet and what's going to be required. Um, so... Just going over the dates. So May 28th was the first touch on the introducing the middle housing ordinance. Um, that's the model ordinance that Commerce has prepared um, that we're utilizing sort of as a basis for this code update. Um, and then presenting some of the initial findings from the code review that Burke Consulting has led um, for this update. On June 10th, we review the preliminary draft middle housing ordinance that we're proposing and recommendations um, in terms of code text changes and things of that sort. Um, today, we're going to be distributing the policy worksheet for review and comment by Planning Commission. So that's going to be distributed electronically, and you'll have about a week to sort of read through and provide some comments. So. Sorry, more assigned work. <laughs> um, <laughs> policy worksheet overview. So the goal of this worksheet is that uh, Burke, the consultant, will review and compile the results to help make future edits to the draft ordinance that we'll continue to work through with Planning Commission before it goes to Council. Um, the results will be shared with Commission and City staff at the July, July 22nd Planning Commission meeting. Just for full transparency, um, department staff are also working on this worksheet um, to sort of provide um, the, the staff perspective on this, um, especially related to the comp plan work that we're doing, um, ensuring that it's consistent and aligned with, with that process. And then the goal... The process will help inform the key next steps in the development of the draft middle housing ordinance that we'll present for review and future approval, sorry, recommendation by Planning Commission before it's forwarded on to Council. Um, so I'm going to transition now real quick to that worksheet itself, just so you can orient to the worksheet. So you will get this in electronic form. Oh, weird. Okay. So um, we have just an overview of the work, um, some guidance from Commerce's website. So there's guidance on the middle housing legislation that was passed um, by, by um, the, the legislation. <laughs> Sorry. 
uh, <laughs> HP 1110. Um, and then we have two separate guidance for tier two and tier three cities as a city Malik Terrace is considered a tier three city. So we're, we're required to implement that guidance. Um, but as you know, with our growth projections and population numbers, we'll most likely um, go above and beyond the 25,000 population threshold. So we are looking to adopt some of that tier two um, approach for the middle housing code update. Um, and then we have some first section is tier approach. So we have the guideline for middle housing for tier two and tier three. Um, the goal here is to put an X under, so you would add an X under each, which tier two, sorry, which tier um, you would most likely support. So whether that's going with the tier two or the tier three, um, so we just put an X in these columns and then any questions or feedback. Second section is the code policy worksheet. So we have the allowed housing typologies and the recommendation that we're going with, which is to um, move forward with adopting all the recommended middle housing types. So you would add an, add an, add an X, um, whether yes, neutral or no. So yes is if you are in support of it, neutral is you don't have any strong opinions and no if you're just, you're not sure that's something that Mount Lake Terrace should consider. And then any questions or feedback you would add. Secondly, um, in the same section is unit density. So just a reminder, anything you see in bold text is actually required to implement um, by legislation. So you would um, look through these recommendations and just add your input on yes, neutral or no, and questions and feedbacks. Um, as we presented previously, the unit density only applies for the middle housing typologies that we're not um, outright banning single family. Um, it's still allowed, and um, so that's important to note. Dimensional standards, um, the recommendation for max building height, um, we're proposing to change that from three stories not to exceed 35 feet to just 35 feet. Um, just make it a bit simpler. Um, and then we have all the other dimensional standards that's in our municipal code. Um, design standards um, related to cottage housing. Courtyard apartments. We have off-street parking requirements. So um, the recommendation that we're proposing, um, are you in support? Yes, neutral or no, and any questions or feedbacks on that? I think you get the, the gist of this, but um, then we have a section on um, definitions that we're hoping to adopt as part of this process. Um, so administrative design review, um, all the middle housing typology types, and then major transit stop, middle housing, single family zones. So it's about an eight page document and we're looking for comments um, by Monday. Um, so by Monday at July 15th at 4 p.m. Um, and I think Shannon will send out that electronic file. Um, and while you're doing this, we also have the new guidance from Commerce that was actually published today for public comment. So we'll be looking at that to see if there's anything that might change here before you. I don't think there should be any major changes, but um, there may be some impacts to this. Um, so you said on that, um, that document, you know, the bold is what's required. Yes. There's a lot of bold. Uh, <laughs> um, so the bold and the uh, columns, the boxes. Okay. Specifically, not the headers. Now, do we <laughs> do, do we have when it's we're being required to provide it in our code? Do we still have the opportunity to shape how we're providing it, or is it more of a 
very blanket. This is what the state is requiring and we can't deviate yeah. one iota from this or have any kind of interpretation. How the text is written is how we have to implement it regardless of how short-sighted or foolhardy yeah. <laughs> the state's um, verbiage is. There's gonna be some nuanced approach, like for example, the off-street parking requirements. Um, we're required to implement it, but if the city chooses to do their own parking study, for example, and demonstrate that um, we can meet that requirement in some form or fashion, um, that's something that Commerce would allow. I don't, Chris, do you know? I think the legislature crafted some of this pretty tight for people to basically, you know, growth management was kind of like a bottoms up approach. Local jurisdictions had more say, I guess, if you will, in how they crafted it. I would say the more recent legislation for middle housing is very top down. And it was crafted that way because the legislature felt like a not enough middle housing was getting accomplished. And so we have a little bit of leeway, but not a lot. We'll take a look at, I didn't have a chance today to take a look at what came out as far as guidance from the Department of Commerce, but I think it's going to not give us a ton of uh, leeway in kind of how we approach some of this stuff. Um, with commerce and all this legislation, right, there's the legislation and then there has to be the interpretation. Um, and because it's newer, it just like in all things, it takes a while for the agencies to figure out these interpretations and st such. And since we're part of the first group doing comp planning, it's, you know, we're gonna kind of get what we get and we're just gonna have to go with it. So I think um, when you look at uh, the, the levels between two and three, we could also, if, if we have to do three, which is required, um, there is some nuances where we did, won't have to do totally three. We could maybe pick and choose some of those threes that we wanna do. And the reason I say that is because when we start getting um, some of our information back on the draft environmental impact statement, I think that will inform our capacity for water and sewer and other things that are going to inform our planning as well. So it's kind of not one size fits all. I think that's where we're gonna have more leeway is to maybe select some of those other things if we want to. If we don't wanna just go straight tier three, are there some things that maybe we wanna do from tier two, knowing that we're gonna pass 25,000 people uh, very shortly, so as part of our planning. So that's kind of something we can think about too of what you guys want to do. But take a look at it, um, do the survey, and then we can kind of uh, talk about it some more, figure it out. I heard there might be changes to the guidance? Um, there could be our clarification. Okay, so we're building this plane a bit as we fly it. Um, I guess there's a chance we'll be looking at this again next year at some point as well to incorporate new changes. Yeah, I mean, we could, but I mean, they got to give guidance for all of these jurisdictions to get this stuff down, stuff going in this, this first round. So I think we have to have something. Yeah. I just know from experience that when we're doing new legislation, Sometimes it's not as smooth as we would like it to be for guidance. <laughs> so that it could be a little bit of a rocky road. Yeah, we do have time. So we have until June 30th, 2025. Yeah, so we do have a little yeah. bit of time for some of this stuff as well. So we can, we can figure it out, but have some conversations. And I think graphics would be helpful um, as part of imparting information as well. I think in my mind, parking's gonna be um, a big issue, yeah. um, required parking. And so that's kind of where I see a little bit of a rub, but we'll just kind of have to walk through that and figure that out as we go. Yeah. So next meeting, July 22nd, we'll 
uh, we'll have a discussion on the plan commission review comments and also provide some feedback um, from staff on the policy worksheet. So bringing that to you. Um, we'll be presenting to you city council August 8th, um, just providing a very high level overview of the work. Um, at this point, we're not really ready to bring them any of the conversations we've been having with planning commission, um, but uh, we'll be providing an overview and sort of orienting them to the next phases of this work. And I think that's all I have. Any questions? Okay. All right. So um, next meeting, there'll be two discussion items, comp plan and middle housing. And then I, there's a presentation as well on a economic development strategic plan process. It's going to be a busy meeting. <laughs> so this is due on the 15th. The thing you just talked about is due on the 15th. But this is due later, right? Yeah, that'll be due July 29th. 29th. Yes. We have a lot of summer homework, if, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, which I would complain to the principal <laughs> if I was you guys. But like, hey, you need to do this homework and that homework. But it's kind of how things are just laying out and a lot of the changes that um, the legislature also wanted to see as part of our planning efforts. So it's how we're moving forward. It just kind of hits at a bad time is all. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to item number eight, director's report. Um, I'll keep this short, hopefully. Just a reminder, July 20th and 21st is Tour de Terrace. Coming up, um, the city will have, I believe, a double booth, actually, this year. We'll have more space, and uh, CED will be a part of it doing information on our, um, I think our big thing is going to be the draft environmental impact statement and um, letting people know that they can comment on that as part of the comp plan and when our meeting's coming up. So getting that word out for public participation um, efforts on that. And then we'll have planning staff there to answer questions that we'll be covering all of Saturday and then all of Sunday as well. So if people have questions and I know um, Engineering will be talking about the Main Street project. I know that stormwater will be there on, I think the urban, I think Laura's gonna be doing urban, uh, her urban tree planning um, maybe and some stormwater stuff. And so there'll be some different things um, that are going on and information for people. Um, and come and get your chip clips, your, uh, what else do we have? Bike reflectors and uh, shopping bags. So a plethora of um, good things for you to pick up and say hi. So we'll be there. And then August 6th is National Night Out. Um, it's a Tuesday evening and that's very well attended as well. And we will be there as well, um, talking to the folks and um, um, I think that's always probably my favorite national night out is. Mine too. Is it? Yes. Yeah, it's just a cool, it's a cool thing and a lot of people come and a lot of kids and stuff. So I think it's um, a good community thing. So um, August 6th for that, we'll be there as well. Um, and then other than that, we're trying to get our public meetings going. We have a lot of um, comp plan review and trying to prepare for the draft EIS. And then like I talked about, we're kind of on that push um, within the next couple of months to get the light rail station open and make sure that we got all of those things in place that we need to have to get ready to open the station. So a lot of things are moving um, forward and we'll also be looking forward to fully launching all of our software, um, hopefully in August. Um, so that's kind of what's going on as well. Any questions about anything? There's a public meeting tomorrow night talking about 
the main uh, Main Street project and right away acquisition, which sounds like a fun time. And unfortunately, I'll try to stay away from that meeting as much as I possibly can. <laughs> um, telling people that we want to acquire right away from them doesn't sound like a good time to me, but um, yeah, so that will be happening tomorrow night, talking about that in the Main Street project. Is uh, that yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow from six to eight. Yeah. So. Is that like an open, more of an open house meeting or is it? Yeah, and I know that they'll be talking about that um, in general as well. I haven't really been involved in the planning of that, but there'll be information and they'll be discussing it. And I'm sure everybody that got a letter will be in attendance at that meeting. So. Who's, who's uh, running that? Is that? Going to be the city engineer then? Yeah, that's uh, city engineer Rich Meredith. And then I'm sure John will be there, the transportation engineer. And there is consultant group working on that effort as well in all those negotiations for right of way acquisition. So that one doesn't seem to have a virtual aspect to it. Or am I just not seeing it? I am, I can't not tell you that. Do you know? I feel like I'm out of the loop. I was gone last week and I'm like, what's happening? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's, it looks, from what I can tell, it's just in house. It's yeah, in -house. okay. So, anyways, that's going on tomorrow evening here at, in this room. But that's kind of the doings, everybody getting ready. I heard July 3rd had a pretty big turnout and went relatively well, I was told. So, um, just trying to work on our events and make them better and then having an events coordinator. That's on YouTube too. Oh, is it? The cool. July 3rd, yeah. Yeah, so just having that um, and trying to make our events um, better, um, I think is getting demonstrated. So, and then there's gonna be some performances here out on the plaza coming up through the summer and a couple of movie nights. Yeah, so some fun stuff happening around the community that people can attend for no charge and some stuff going on. So that's pretty cool. So any questions other than that? Okay. All right. Uh, moving to item number nine, miscellaneous business by call of planning commissioners. Anybody have any miscellaneous business? Absences coming up, vacations, et cetera, et cetera. Not hearing or seeing anything. Just want to double check with our online commissioners. Nothing here. Nope. All right. Well, with that, I'll go ahead and declare this meeting adjourned. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>